Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. My name is Martin Warwick and I'm talking with Dr. Hassan Ahmed, who is um, from Affirmed Networks. He is indeed the chairman and the CEO. Hassan, thanks for talking to us. Um, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about NFE and SDN. And uh, first of all, I'd like to put something to you and see whether you agree with this or not. Hitherto, a lot of the emphasis has been on SDN and then over the past couple of years it's been on NFV and these two technologies are seeing running in parallel and meeting at infinity at some point but they've never been mentioned together. One does one thing at the base, one does another thing at the top um, and but now suddenly we're hearing of the two running in tandem together and being together but is one more equal than the other? Yeah, that's a great question Martin. I, mean, really, I think it depends a lot on your vantage point. Um, uh, you know, the two technologies are both modernization technologies at the end of the day. Sure. And SDN has been very, very prevalent in the data center and in enterprise networks and so forth. Uh, NFV is, is really the technology that is driving the transformation of operator networks. So if you're an operator or if you're building operator networks, then NFV clearly is what's more prevalent in your mind. You can make valuable transformations of the operator network with NFV uh, without having to really think a lot about SDN and mm. vice versa. But they really do coexist. If you're truly building modern networks, then uh, both of them have a role to play. NFE is the one that really captures the attention of the operator because at the layer that the operators work at, which is delivering a service to you and I, um, NFV is what brings the intelligence to achieve that. So what does this coexistence mean in terms of uh, development as far as carriers and operators are concerned? Um, well, uh, I think what, what you're seeing in uh, operator networks, and we're seeing this actually across the board now, it's really picked up steam, is how operators are bringing, operators as enterprises have typically had an IT network, and they've had a network on which they delivered services, sure. and the two have really just started to merge. And so this coexistence is happening because at the fundamental level, uh, data centers and, and so forth are taking advantage of all of the capabilities of SDN. And then when you get down to what the business of the operator is, which is creating services and, and, uh, and providing uh, uh, you know, valuable things to you and I, that's all happening really at the NFV, uh, uh, with NFV technologies and transforming networks. The two are just coming together. In fact, you see it in the, in the operator's networks, even their organizations are melding into one and uh, as opposed to having two separate organizations. And so, um, you know, the ops teams and the development teams and so on, they're all getting really smart about both of these technologies. Thank you. Okay. So, let's begin at the beginning then as far yeah, sure. as NFE is concerned. Where do you start? What are the priorities? We're now talking about phase two of NFE coming into being. Where is it going to take us? Uh, you know, uh, that's a very interesting question. We, uh, when we started a firm, gosh, four and a half years ago, uh, and NFV hadn't really come on the scene yet, uh, we imagined that the change or transformation that would happen in operators' networks would happen largely because of the business forces driving it. I mean, fundamentally, uh, the economics of operator networks were turning upside down with all the growth in mobile in particular. So we thought that actually mobile was the first place where all of this would start. And sure enough, that's the way it's played out. Um, the uh, uh, NFV is, is um, a very important technology for making mobile business, uh, business models work in operators. Um, it's, that's prime time today. Uh, we have, gosh, 23 or so deployments that we're involved in um, and another 40 or so trials tra transforming these networks. Um, and it just so happens that the technology that, that exists happens to fit very neatly with the performance needs of, of mobile. Um, if you think about where this is all headed, the reality is that this technology is going to impact every aspect of the network over, I call it a decade. Um, we've seen these large transformations before, and if you can imagine that networks today are built as boxes in, data, in uh, central offices, that's all going to go away over some period of time, and we're going to end up with software running in data centers and very simple connectivity out to access points, towers, and so on. So ultimately, it'll affect every part of the network. Uh, to me, actually, the most important aspect of this is not the network transformation itself. That's a necessary uh, step. But the real value in this is the programmability and the flexibility that it brings to the network. 
so that operators can innovate services. Right now, it's so hard to innovate a new service in an operator network that they um, really can only do big mass market things. But, but in a world of IP services where we're seeing all these over-the-top um, value-added services that, that come to you and I, the operator can really participate in that and drive new revenue streams. And, and the essential tool in their network is having a flexible network where they can innovate quickly. Okay, thank you. What about, that's on the, the upside, the positive side of things, what do you think are the emerging pain points as far as the development of real-world NFV is concerned? Uh, you know, we're, we're at a stage, I think, in the, uh, in the life of, uh, the adoption life of NFV, uh, where we're relatively early. Uh, I, 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 but, I, but I think it's, it's moving into more of a scale adoption kind of phase. And the reason, I th uh, so what's happened that's allowed it to make that transition? I think a um, couple of things. Uh, one is when, uh, when NFV and, uh, and products in this space first emerged, um, the operator, you know, was able to ask the question, well, you know, have these products really caught up with what I'm already doing in my, in my current networks? If they're not, I can't really afford to take a hit in some sense. Um, against what I'm already capable of doing. What's, the reason I think this market's at a tipping point today is because what we've shown, for example, with our products is that our platforms now outperform the best of the legacy platforms. And therefore, it's sort of silly to still be investing in the legacy when you're not really um, losing anything by going, going to the new, which is going to be your future anyway. So I think that's, that's a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, and, and so overcoming that was... Uh, one issue. I think the really the bigger problems or the bigger transformations that an operator's, operators face as they really try to deploy this broadly in their network is um, really the restructuring that they have to do even when they're inside their own organizations. At, um, you know, these are much more software-centric solutions. Operations teams have to think a lot more about software and software products than they do about boxes and replacing cards and things like that. Um, uh, you know the operations models are much much simpler. At the end of the day, one of the values of this is to is to reduce opex, but fundamentally that means that you're aligning teams and making teams smaller, and that's uh, that's a big hurdle to overcome. So I think I think there are social issues that have to be overcome. Well, yeah, there's organizational and yeah. social issues because it's going to make big changes in within the operator itself, and jobs are going to go. That is, uh, that is going to be part of it. I mean, at the end of the day, where NFE drives a lot of efficiency, um, and uh, the, the amount of effort that you need to support networks is, is different. In a lot of ways, jobs will go, but in a lot of ways, jobs will transform as well. Uh, you know, we're going to take people who are uh, trained to, uh, you know, do break-fix type, type uh, <laughs> operations, and we're going to transform them into people who operate just fundamentally at a higher level and they're going to be thinking about services and how you provision services and that's a retraining exercise so I, I don't think that people necessarily have to go uh, I think their jobs are going to change and and this is one of the big things that operators are focused on is Absolutely. how do they how do they retrain their people sure yeah how do you think a business case for NFV we've talked around the edges of it mm -hmm. um, OPEX CAPEX etc etc but how do you think a business case for NFV should be developed and articulated uh, well, you know, this is this is a rapidly evolving area as as, as more and more operators adopt this technology. Um, what we found is that there are ver there are quite a few dimensions to the things that go into the business case. Uh, capex and opex are obviously the two big pieces of the puzzle, and uh, capex is the easy part in some sense. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you can measure it. Uh, opex, I think, is really the area that where there's a bigger bang for the for the buck, as it were. Um, what, what I find when we talk to our large operators is their OPEX numbers are actually probably twice their CAPEX. So while they can focus on cutting CAPEX, the reality is they really need to be focused on OPEX. And a lot of things go into the OPEX equation. I mean, it's people, it's uh, power, air conditioning, space, uh, and really it's about how long it takes you to do something. And I think ultimately once you get to a baseline, it's how long it takes you to do things that will be the the, the thing that has the most long, longevity. And the two big things that I think factor into that equation are 
Uh, well, if, if you take a look at some of our customers, um, uh, you know, how long does it take you to deploy a network? We, we, have, a, we have a customer, Elephant Talk, that um, uh, does services for a lot of large operators uh, around the world who were able to, from a standing start, select a firm and have a network up and running in which they're serving tier one operators in three months. Well, that's, that's an unheard of a yeah, accomplishment. Sure it's, uh, you know, in, in, their, in their model, and they're a fast moving operator, it was, in, it was a year but pr pr prior to that. What we see with our large operator customers is what used to take them two or three years to do, they could now do in a year. So they immediately, even just to build the network, it goes faster. The real value, I think, is in the cost of innovation. Um, in today, in mobile networks, for example, if you want to do even the simplest of services, it's so manual that you spend a year doing a service, maybe nine months. Um, and therefore, you can't innovate a lot because the cost of innovation is so high. Uh, but in using some of these uh, software tools that, that, you know, for example, we've developed, you can take that same year-long activity and drop it down to hours. And when you can create new ideas and provision them in hours, you can go and experiment with a lot of different business models, and the cost of innovation it becomes low, your rate of innovation goes up, and I think that actually ends up driving a big part of the, of, uh, of the long-term value of, of these systems. I was talking yesterday to Margaret Kiyoshi, who's mm -hmm. a distinguished network architect at AT&T Labs and a leading light in NFV. Yes, she is. And she was saying that AT&T wants to have 70 to 75 percent of its network virtualized within five years. Now that's an enormous ask for any organization. For something as big as at and it's, it, it's very hard to believe they can manage it. Frank, well that's my take on it anyway. But my, my point I'm trying to make, Hassan, is for a long time to come, we're not just talking about five years, I'm, you know, 10, 12, 15 years maybe, maybe longer, we're going to have a physical network and a virtualized network running together and both components will exist at the same time. Um, what effect is that going to have? Is that going to make things more difficult, do you think? Because there isn't really any alternative. Nobody's going to rip out legacy kit and, um, and start again. So how important is that going to be to, making, to, uh, to carry the virtualization program through without disrupting the physical side of things? Well, uh, by the way, I, I, Margaret is, in fact, a leading light in the space. And I would not. Um, count out or bet against uh, AT&T. <laughs> Obviously, we work with them, so we, we have a lot of insight. And uh, this is an organization that is very, very motivated and focused on, on achieving it. And I, I think they're going to do great things, quite honestly. Um, uh, I think uh, it, you know, there are aspects, even on day one, there are parts of the network, like mobile, where there's a lot of growth, where you want to transform, you get the biggest bang for the buck early on in the life of the network. And, and therefore, almost by definition, everything we do has to coexist with the legacy. Because while I might transform my mobile network, I still have my physical core and I'm and it's still, it's still sitting there. So, uh, you know, the nature of coexistence uh, and, and of transformation is that it's not a flash cut. And by definition, we have to coexist in, in those, in those uh, ecosystems. And, and sure enough, that's what we do. In fact, most operator uh, transformations all involve uh, being able to interoperate with the legacy. Now, one of the things that helps us here is that there are well-defined interfaces in a telco world in order to ensure interoperability, and, and we use those to support both the physical and the virtualized network simultaneously. Um, but once you've made the step, and once you've started making the transformation, then it almost never makes sense to be on two separate networks at infinitum, right? It just sure. because it's just too expensive. Yeah. And and so what happens always is that over a period of some over some period of time, you know, let's just call it a decade for talking purposes, mm -hmm. uh, networks really do transform and the vast majority of them become um, on the new technology. I mean a good example of this in history is if you go back to uh, you know sort of the two thousand era um, uh, you know, the vast majority of networks were built on TDM and Sonnet and, and IP, and today that's not the case at all, right? Today, the vast majority of networks are on IP. The underlying optical transport is, is rapidly becoming packet over optical. 
and um, and so we, we and you know it's been you know give or take a decade or so <laughs> in, the, in that transformation so so these things do happen and, and and as long as you have a good set sense of what the time frame is you you know these are major changes to the world's networks and it's kind of neat to be doing them the change has been driven uh, and NFE has been driven in this instance for once by the operators themselves rather mm -hmm. than the vendors and the reason being of course that the uh, the, the vendor the operator community are, should we say a little tired of being locked into particular <laughs> vendors and having to buy the same thing over and over again um, regardless so but within that so they're, they're pushing to have openness how important to you at a firm and how important to your customers is that notion of openness, whether it's open source or open ecosystem or whatever it may be? Uh, I think it's critically important. I mean, there's just no reason to, tra to transform a network and have it be another uh, sort of closed ecosystem, right? It's, 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 it's bad for everybody. And in fact, you know, in, in a world where it's just operators competing against operators, Everybody's on a level playing field. If you're locked into this vendor or that vendor in closed ecosystems, you, everybody's got the same problem. But that's just not the world anymore. The reality is that uh, operators aren't just competing against operators. The fact of the matter is that uh, you know IP has really leveled the playing field, and and therefore agility and uh, and being able to uh, uh, you know compete on a world stage is a much much more important uh, issue, um, which means that we have to see open technologies, we have to see IT type technologies, but carrier grade happen in the operator ecosystem to, in order, and, and, and agile technologies that allow the operator to compete. So I, th I think the openness is a critically important piece of the puzzle for, uh, for operators as they go forward. To wind things up, Hassan, um, how near are we to seeing real world NFE? We've had the, we've had the, the hype, the massive hype at the beginning, burst out of nowhere and NFE suddenly it's there, centre stage. We've had proofs of concept, we've had trials. How close are we to, to seeing real world live implementation? Well actually live implementations are happening today. Uh, the, um, and, and you know I think this is a, a great follow-on from your previous question because <clears throat> the fact is as you said NFE is being driven by the operators. Uh, you know, there's perhaps less incentive on the part of the incumbent suppliers to really create this innovation and disrupt their own uh, their own product lines and so forth. <clears throat> if you actually look at the history of innovation in networking, every major innovation has been brought by uh, typically an innovator, a disruptive innovator, and this is what and this is what firms like mine live for is moments in time where you can find those disruptions and and go out there and, and disrupt. Uh, and so we've had the good fortune of, of being on the leading edge of this. Uh, I, you know, I think the time for NFE deployments and real world deployments is actually happening and it's right now. We have, uh, like I say, 23 or so live deployments underway currently. We have another 40 or so trials. So this is very real in the mind of the operator. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, uh, tier one operators that have built networks that are carrying live traffic. Um, on, uh, on, on our uh, infrastructure. So real world NFE deployments are here today, they're, they're happening. And I would say really the big observation for me in the marketplace today is that there's very little evangelism required at this point. I think because we've hit that tipping point where the new products are actually much better than the, than the best of the legacy products, uh, operators are going to move much more quickly, and um, I, I think we're witnessing its its arrival right now. Well, things are certainly changing. Yes. And Ahmed, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you.